Hello YouTube. If you clicked on this video, it's because this year you have decided to build yourself a pair of massive doors. So massive indeed that you will struggle to walk through doorways. And if that is the case, you're in luck because I have in my hand a master plan that is going to help you reach that goal. And it's a plan I'm going to be following as well, because yes, 2023 is going to be the year of massive shoulders for me as well. For those of you that know my goal physique, I deprioritized shoulder development for the past two years because I wanted to make sure that my arms, my bicep and triceps, overpowered the dart. This was the look I was going for because I personally do not like a look where your darts are so big that they dwarf and mug the upper arm. But I've now gotten to a point where the bicep is so big in particular that I have a lot of room to grow and I can finally catch up. So gone are the days of no vertical pressing and I'm going to start really focusing on shoulders again and try to see how big I can get them. And for that, I have a challenge to offer. It's going to be a one-year challenge where we, together, as a community, are going to see how big we can get our delts. This is not going to focus on any gimmicks. So we're not going to do anything special. We're going to focus on time-tested methods. And these are the methods that I implemented in this program. So if you are interested, join in. And right now, I'm going to give you all of the details that are going to be relevant to your progression. So as I said, it's going to be all hard work, all time-tested movement. And therefore, we're going to go by the safest and easiest path possible, which is direct work. If you want to grow a muscle group, you're going to have to find ways to target the muscle group directly. It's the best way, of course, but it's also the way that is not going to lead you towards pursuits that are just going to be a waste of time at the end of the day. So you already know the methods we're going to be employing. If you want to grow your shoulders, what do you need to do? Vertical presses. This is going to be your bread and butter. And then after that, we're also going to be adding some isolation movement. Isolation movement that I will call elevations because most of it will be shoulder elevations, but it can really be any type of lifts that are going to target the shoulder joint directly without putting too much stress on the system. So something that deloads the elbow joint, for example, will be welcome. Something that deloads the wrist will be welcome because we're going to have to make sure that our entire system is healthy since the challenge, again, is going to be an entire year. We're going to reconvene in a year and see our results. If you're going to burn out in two months, you are going to fail the challenge. So this is going to be extremely important. Now, how exactly are we going to get to bigger shoulders? What is the metric we're going to use? Well, if you know the methods of progression that I recommend, we are going to look at tonnage. Tonnage is the absolute amount of volume that you do in relation to the intensity. But it doesn't stop there. You see, many people, when they hear tonnage, they think, okay, if tonnage is the absolute number, then the best way to increase tonnage for muscle group is just to do more sets and reps. The issue is that if you do that, you're quickly going to do junk volume because you're just going to retake weights that are very easy for you, thinking I get more tonnage and therefore my muscles grow. You are not looking at a very important component of tonnage and that is intensity. So the performance aspect is also going to be important, meaning that we are going to gain strength, but not strength for the sake of strength. It's not going to be strength just to get stronger. It's going to be strength to increase tonnage, meaning that you're going to start with a given weight for a given amount of reps, and the goal will be to increase that weight for the same amount of reps with the same technique after a year. This is going to be the metric we're going to use because if you manage to become stronger on vertical presses and isolations for the shoulders, you got bigger, your muscles grew. Cave add to this, be careful, do not overbook. This is not going to be a bulking challenge. You can gain weight if you want, but we're going, to pre we're going to prioritize either recomps or slow weight gains. Don't go dirty bulking for this. You wouldn't be actually following the challenge. You would be doing a Burger King challenge, and this is not the point. So now that this has been established, what are we going to be picking in terms of lifts? Well, this is the way I want you to go about it. You're going to pick one to two vertical presses, all right? 
Not three. I don't want you to be too crazy in terms of variations. We still want to remain within a certain range of specificity. So one to two is going to be our bracket. And then you're going to pick two to three elevations or isolations for the shoulders. Again, not four, not five, and don't go below two. Two to three is going to be our striking range. Again, same specificity range with some slight variations. All of which is going to help us in both ways, both to increase tonnage, because we're going to be able to get more reps in, while remaining specific, which means that the neurological adaptation is not going to be shot. You're going to remain within the same line of movement and it's also going to add some variety to the movement because the issue with being too specific is that you always move in the same fashion, meaning that you can start to accumulate overused injuries. And for the shoulders, it would pretty much kill the challenge. That is not the goal. So by multiplying the amount of variations we do within a bracket, we're going to be able to move through different planes of motions, which is going to deload the tendon and still allow us to eat the muscle. So in total, the max amount of movements for the shoulders you're going to be doing is five, and the minimum is going to be three. For me, and I'm going to get back to the example of my plan afterwards, I am going to do one compound movement, the overhead press, and three elevations or isolations that are all going to be variations of the lateral rate. I'm going to explain to you later why I did that. You will see that this plan is not my plan I make you do. It's a plan I crafted for all of us on the channel, meaning that there is a ton of flexibility, okay? This is not supposed to be NH does this, we all copy NH. No, it's a master plan for the shoulders and we're all following it using the principles and variables I crafted because I believe they're going to be best suited. So once you have picked your press, we're going to then move on to the rep range. But before that, I want to insist on one thing. The type of presses you're going to be picking need to be ones that you enjoy doing and that you can do comfortably for a long time. We are not going to pick things that are optimal. Fuck optimal. Pick what you like. I'm picking a barbell overhead press because it's what I like. If you don't like it and you like a Viking press, pick the Viking press. The one stipulation I have is it must be a vertical press because a vertical press is a type of compound movement that puts the load on the shoulders. Okay, so this is going to be our emphasis. Same for the elevations. I don't care what is the most optimal way to isolate the shoulder. We just want ways to hit the three heads of the shoulders and spare the joint. So any type that you like, if even if it's upright rows, even if it's whatever type of isolation for the shoulders that I don't know about, doesn't matter. If it's an isolation, it deloads the wrist and the elbow, it is good for me. So now that that has been established, let's move on to the rep range. There is going to be a wide area of choice for the rep ranges. I personally recommend that you pick one to two for your presses and one for the variation. What I mean by one to two for the presses is this. Let's say you pick one, one press like I did. You can just stick to one rep range if you want it, but if you want more flexibility, you can pick two. If you pick two vertical presses, you also have the choice of one to two. So the maximum rep ranges you will get is four, and they might repeat themselves. Okay, a concrete example is, for example, you pick overhead press with a barbell, overhead press with a dumbbell, you can do 6 to 10 for the overhead press barbell, and then 8 to 12, and 4 to 8 for the dumbbell, and another 8 to 12. This is what I mean. This is the cap, okay? I don't want you to go higher than that for the same reason. We want to stay within the same rep ranges because we want to be able to repeat efforts within the same rep ranges. I've seen too many people vary rep ranges too much, and therefore they never really are able to track progression because they're all over the place. So I have put a hard cap on this, and it's the same for the variations of the isolation movements for the shoulders. One rep range per isolation, why? For the same reason, that way it's easier to track progression and we don't bullshit ourselves. This is going to be, as I said, a way to promote progression because it's going to prevent you from stalling or plateauing and it also promotes volume accumulation. So all of that is the good stuff. Then if we look in priority at the compounds, because of course the vertical process is going to be the most important way for us to build up the shoulders, the ones that I recommend for that type of polyarticular movement is going to be 4 to 8, 6 to 10, or 8 to 12, all right? That's three rep ranges. In this case, I'm not forcing you to use these. You do whatever you want. I just think that these are very good because they're clean. 
you never go below four reps. It's going to promote controlled reps and it's also going to promote intensity but also give you the ability to do volume. Going to be straight with you, I never go below six reps for the overhead press because in the past I had a tendency to do too low of rep ranges for the overhead press. And what I found is that my form degraded so much that I didn't really feel like I was working the shoulders anymore. I was, but I wasn't really in the movement. And therefore, I never managed to actually stick to it. My progression was all over the place. I now have fixed that because, of course, I'm not just dumping that into your lab. I actually tested this before telling you I've been doing that for two months. I'm going to show some pictures, some, some footage of my shoulders. They're still small compared to yours. Maybe they're big, but for my body, they're small. But I'm starting to catch up, I see good results, and I also have perfect tendon health. So this is the way to go for me. For the compounds, never go below 4 reps, stick to 12 reps max. And then for the isolation, we'll go higher, of course. We're going to do 2 to 12 reps or 10 to 15 reps. I recommend not going higher than 15 reps to not accumulate too much junk volume. If you want to, you can, it's absolutely your choice. But this is going to also be a good way to accumulate volume while still being intense. Now, in terms of day-to-day, -day, how much do we do per day? Well, I recommend you do three to four sets per day. So if on the day you decide to train the shoulders, you should do three or four sets. You can push the bell and do more. If you want to do six sets per day, you can. It's going to be at some point an obligation for those of you that are going to do more and more sets because if you only have three days to train and you want to do a total of 18 sets, math dictates that if you only do three sets a day, it's not going to work. So these are just guidelines, but know that the more sets for the shoulders you do for the day, the less intense you can be and the less quality volume you're accumulating. A good compromise would be to do three to four sets of compounds for the shoulders and then complement that with three to four sets of isolation. You don't need to be as intense for the isolation. You're pre-fatigued because of the compound press you did beforehand. So it works perfectly. And you're going to aim for six to eight sets of presses a week. These are also raw numbers. You can go higher than that. You can go up to 12 if you wanted. You can even go up to 16. I will again repeat what I just said. The more sets you do, the less intensity you can use. But if you're someone you can recover very fast on the shoulder press and you train five times a week and you decide to do presses on four days and you do four sets each, again, math shows that you can go as high as 16. Up to you. I have found personally that presses don't tax me at all, vertical presses. I can spam them. So I might get to a point where I spam them, but I'm, I'm not there yet. And if you're not there yet, I also recommend you take it easy. Just understand that the upper cap of, set, of sets per week for vertical presses for the shoulder in particular might be higher than one might actually think. And then for the isolation, it's going to be a little bit higher as well. Six to 12 sets per week. It's a wide uh, range also because you're going to find that some people recover faster from them. But if you do your isolation properly, it should be fairly easy to spam. So in total, if you follow my guidelines, you will do 12 to 20 sets of shoulder work per week. Keep in mind that this is not a fixated number. It fluctuates. I'm giving you room, meaning that if you do 12 sets of very intense work, it might be a good idea as a progression scheme to increase afterwards to 13 sets, 14 sets, keeping the same weight. And then maybe when you get to 15 or 16 sets, you up the weight and you go back down to 12. This is the reason why I always run a propaganda system for set and rep range that evolve on this channel. Because as you can tell, it gives you a ton of flexibility. And if you think that is, this is complicated and you are confused, it's very easy, just like with most of lifting. When you start applying this master plan to your training, it's going to start making a ton of sense. Play around. Don't be afraid. Taking off certain reps or adding a set for a day is not going to kill you. It's going to give you a shit ton of experience. Now, this has been said. You know your rep range. You know the lifts you're supposed to pick. You know the set range. What does it look like in regards to popular splits? Well, if you do a full body... You can do do sets whenever because it's a full body. So it's going to be up to you. If you do a push-pull leg, I recommend doing your vertical presses on pull. And you can do your isolation movement on legs if you don't have enough space on the pull on the push day. And then for upper lower, your presses will be on the upper and the isolation can be whenever as well. These are also just guidelines that I'm giving for the people who are not as experienced with their split. But if you have been running your split for a while, you already know that it's fairly easy to find places 
to fit your work, you just have to look at specificity and when the shoulder has been worked before. We're going to get back to that uh, in this following line, but this is going to be very important for this master plan. The goal is to have peak recovery. So if you do heavy vertical presses on Tuesday and you need to place them somewhere else in the program for an additional four sets and you have the choice between, I don't know, Wednesday or Friday, which is the best day? Friday, because you have more time to recover. All right. These are just basics. I know that you guys already understand. Them. Now, let's talk about the one half rule. What is the one half rule? La, la, la loi du 1 demi. La loi du 1 demi dictates that if you have a three day split and you have set to, to put somewhere in the split, you most likely will use two of these three days to put your sets. Because I suppose that after three days, you're going to have a rest day, meaning that it's going to make the most sense. If you have a four day split, same thing, la loi du 1 demi, you cut in half, you have two days where you're going to do your shoulder work. Then if you do a six day split, three day, etc., etc. This is not connected to the amount of days in a week. An eight day split that transcends the way we humans decide calendar weeks is still going to require you to train four days, even though there's only seven days in a week. That also makes a ton of sense the second you start applying it. This is not a rule set in stone. It's again to maximize intensity and it's to maximize recovery. Depending on the way your rest days are set, it should also be something that you look at when you decide where to place your shoulder work. I have faith in you. You're not an idiot. Now, talking about something that you must look at, we have to talk about the elephant in the room and that is the horizontal pressing volume. Because yes, you only have one set of shoulders. You don't bench press and then you switch the shoulder joint with another one for vertical pressing. Meaning that the amount of bench press or dips or push-ups that you do is going to compete with the vertical pressing. There is a saving gra grace to that very argument and that is the fact that I've always found that vertical pressing done properly with a style that you enjoy is not taxing on the shoulder joint. If anything, it is, going to be it is going to benefit the health of the shoulder joint because it has curative properties. This means that if you program, you have a higher chance of being able to do your vertical pressing safely if you do them after the horizontal presses. Whereas if you open with the vertical pressing, you might find that you have damaged your ability to do your horizontal pressing. However, this also is just my experience. You might not have the same experience. I'm telling you that so that you know that just because you do an horizontal press on Tuesday does not mean that this day is a day where you cannot do any shoulder work. That's idiotic. Of course, you can do your shoulder work and you will find that you will most likely not lose any performance and might even recuperate faster from it. But I know that some of you guys love bench press and you're going to be afraid that your vertical pressing is going to take away from your ability to perform. Even though some people that I personally respect on this platform have quote unquote proven that the carryover from vertical pressing to horizontal pressing is almost void and no, I would use the same argument that they utilize to tell you that if there is no carryover between the two types of presses, it might also mean that the type of fatigue accumulated is not going to impact the performance on the other lift. But you all, again still only have one set of shoulders, so pay attention to that. Now, let's talk about what I'm going to do. What am I going to do with this master plan? What is the way I'm going to adapt it? Okay, well, following my, my rules, following the guidelines I just gave you guys, I will pick the overhead press with a barbell as my vertical press. It's the only one I'm going to pick because it's the only type of vertical presses that I like. And the rep ranges I'm going to use are two folds. I'm going to do a 6 to 10 and an 8 to 12. So I stay with high volume. I don't like high intensity on the presses anymore. But the 6 to 10 is going to allow me to use slightly more weight and I'm going to use slightly less weight for the 8 to 12 or I might stick with the same weight and do a quote-unquote deload with a 6 to 10, which is not technically a deload, it's an intensity deload, and then go back up to 12 reps and then add more weights, etc, etc. I'm going to put some footage of me over at pressing so that you look at my form, not so that you can copy it, but so that you can start to stop giving a fuck about what people say. Look at my elbows, I do not lock and I never lock. Why? I don't like it. Locking gives me tendonitis in my elbows. There is no fucking point, okay? Nothing magical happens when you do this, all right? You get slightly more tricep activation. This is a shoulder master plan. There is no point in you locking if you don't want to lock. If you love to lock, you're going to get more trap activation as well. By all means, please do it, but don't let anyone bully you into doing compound movements the way they do them. 
I'm going to press an entire year without locking once, and my shoulders are going to be big and healthy. So that is my vertical press. Then for my isolations, I'm going to do with I'm going to go with dumbbell and cable lateral raises. I hate doing lateral raises standing up because it breaks my shoulder. So how do I walk around it? Well, I grab onto the rack, I let my torso shift like this, and then I do my raises in that range of motion because that way my shoulder feels tremendous. This is the way I prefer. And I'm going to use one rep range, like I told you guys, 10 to 12 reps, all right? It's not going to be as easy to actually progress on this, but it's an isolation movement. If you progress 10 to 15 pounds on your lateral raises in your year, and you don't cheat and you don't bullshit your form and you stay with the same rep range, I bet you can bet your ass that your shoulders are going to get bigger. Then my third isolation movement, I have one compound and three isolation, is the bent over raises for more rear delt and upper back activation, 10 to 15, 10 to 15 reps, so more uh, of a higher rep range for this one. Again, these isolations can be any movements that you want. These are the ones that I personally like. And I'm going to do that three times a week. And my goal, my, my target I want to hit is 12 to 16 sets for shoulders total in a week. So it's most likely going to be something like, again, six to eight of compounds and then six to eight in that rep range as well of isolation. It is going to be more feasible for most people to do more isolation sets than you do compounds because it's just less fatiguing. But as I said, someone like me finds the vertical pressing to be very easy to recover from. Again, these are things you're going to have to, have to experiment with. And don't you worry about it. You will certainly never start with doing so many sets. It's because I have some time on you. I started before you to actually beta test this entire plan that I'm already at that level. So let me give you an example of what a novice that wants to build up his shoulders would actually be doing following this plan. You're going to pick your vertical pressing. Let's say you're like me and you like overhead press. Okay. And you say that you like 8 to 12. You're a novice. You're going to do one rep range. You do not need more rep ranges to progress as a novice. I guarantee you that. Then you pick one isolation. So one compound, one isolation. You pick lateral, lateral raises because you're a man of, of culture. And you do 10 to 12 reps. One rep range as well. You will do that one time a week. So you're going to do three or four sets of vertical pressing once a week and three or four sets of isolation for the shoulders once a week. It's going to be a total of six to eight total sets. This is all you need to progress as a novice. Do not do more than that. Our goal is to make you give a, get a taste of high intensity reps. Now, the million dollar question is, do I go to failure? And the answer is, if you like, I personally don't like going to failure on presses because I've had a ton of nerve damage in my neck and upper back. And I always tweak something when I grind that last rep. So you know what I do? I don't do that last rep. I do reps in reserve one. For the isolation, I go to failure because nothing bad is going to happen. You can do that as well if you want. And then from there, you're going to build up. How do we build up? It's always what I have you guys do on my programs. We start with a select amount of set and reps that is as small as possible. Then we expand. That's an evolving rep range. An evolving rep range or set range does this. It's a bubble, it increases, increases, increase, 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 and then when it reaches critical mass and you can't program and progress anymore, it shrinks back down but higher in intensity. You're going up and up and up in terms of intensity, and again, if we look at it like a bubble, the bubble pops and it goes higher and higher and higher. What does it mean in practical terms and not in weird French allegories? Well, it means that you start with your overhead press, and we're going to say that you're going to do again... 8 to 12, okay? 8 to 12 for 4 sets. You are with 100 pounds, all right? Once you get the ability to do 12, 11, 11, 10, now you up the weight. But you're not going to up the weight and stay with the same rep range or the same sets. What we can do is we can shrink you back down to 3 sets. Now you do 3 sets of still 8 to 12, but you're going to use an additional 2.5 pounds. So now you're still going to go up in weight, but you're going to slightly shrink back on volume. But then you're going to get back the same amount of reps. And when that happens, what do we do? We go up again. I'm not going to spend a million years explaining that to you. There is the evolving rep range playlist where I explain all of that in details. And at the end of the day, no need to listen to me or anyone. Try it with your own body and you will find that this makes a ton of sense. So this is how we ramp up. You're going to add more sets and you're going to add more reps as time goes by. While also, of course, making sure that you increase the weight so as to increase the intensity and not do junk volume. And this should get you to an intermediate stage. So for the intermediates on this channel, 
An example for you would be, for example, that you will get to a point where you are going to pick two vertical presses, overhead press and dumbbell overhead press. The rep range you're going to select for your overhead press is 4 to 8 because you love intensity and you love to grind for three sets. And your dumbbell overhead press is going to be 8 to 12 reps, so more volume, of course, which makes a ton of sense with the dumbbell overhead press because the toughest part is to get the dumbbell on the shoulder and the first rep. And then you're going to do four sets for that. So it's going to be most of your volume coming from that and the intensity and progression coming from the barbell overhead press. And then, because again, you are a man of culture and you are an upright row enjoyer, you're going to pick the upright row as your shoulder isolation movement. And you're going to do 10 to 15 reps because you're not a jabroni and you understand that this is not a lift you should be ego lifting or trying to max out on. And you're going to do four sets as well. You do this once a week, which means that you get a total of 11 total sets. You have a, a breathing room of one set on the overhead press, meaning that you can do four to eight reps for three to four sets, meaning that you get from 11 to 12 sets total in a week. And this is going to give you a ton of shoulder work and you will find that your recovery is also going to be maximized. You can modify the rep ranges when you get more, exper uh, more experience. You can modify the set ranges as well. Again, more breathing room gives you more ability to actually manipulate volume and intensity. And if you're an intermediate, you should be able to do that. And the objective for anyone who follows the master plan is, of course, going to be to get massive jacked shoulders by, pro by prioritizing progression and tonnage accumulation, but also healthy shoulders. And I'm going to end the video on that. I insist on this point. There is no point in you burning out. So how do we actually approach this master plan? We start small and then we increase, then we ramp up. So you're going to start with as little sets and reps as possible with intense weight. And you're going to add them, even if you're not a novice. I did that. Please do that as well. That way you can monitor the health of the shoulders. So you start with low sets, high intensity, and then you add reps and sets in the fashion I already prescribed. And when it comes to actually managing fatigue, tendon fatigue, and also muscle fatigue, keep in mind this. Compounds and isolations are both important, but they don't weight the same. Compounds give you more fatigue, which also means they give you more stimulus. Meaning what? The priority in the program is compounds. Never skip your compounds. People who get big shoulders out of vertical, out of lateral races alone, are for the most part on drugs. You want big, round, bulbous shoulders, you're going to have to get stronger on vertical presses. There is no way around that. And then the isolation is going to be a nice way to complement these movements. They're not useless, but they are less important. So if one day you have to skip a set, you skip the set of isolation and not the set of vertical presses. I hope that this makes a lot of sense. And that's this. This is that for this master plan. It starts today. In a year's time, we're going to reconvene and we're going to discuss our progress. We might even post pictures. If you guys are interested, I might even make a compilation video about all of our physiques and see how much we evolved. So if you are in this and you joined the shoulder challenge, let me know in the comments. I'm also going to use this video as a blog post of sorts to tell you guys about my progression. I hope you are going to do it as well. I believe that together we can build massive shoulders that are going to make everyone doubt that we're actually natural. I'm going to leave you with that. Start as soon as possible and I will get back to you very soon.